Hey guys, here we go again. It is 1.29 p.m. on the uh, 27th of July in, uh, I guess, the year 2021. We'll roll with that. Um, so last time, we just covered a few things. Luke's name, the recipient of this account, um, why I'm actually using Matthew as the general control. It won't be the only one because we could compare Luke to uh, various other accounts. And um, we went through the chapter three and the, the very different genealogy given by Luke. The fact that it was backwards to any way that uh, an, an Israelite writer would present a genealogy, how there were at least 20 more names in Luke's, and how they did not match up whatsoever. Once we get back to David and back to Adam, it matches up. Nothing in between actually does. So, all right, here we go. We're going to start in, uh, in Luke 4. And uh, as a quick update, so um, part two of Ancient America in Notes on American Archaeology will be out soon. Um, the, uh, the, the wording and the names in this are so challenging. I've actually had to re-record it a number of times. And um, we, we had a new book that's been sponsored, which it should be very interesting. We'll see if I can actually stay on YouTube. I'm already obviously shadow banned. I have been for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, I have considered looking around at, at other creators and giving subscriber counts and, and looking at the, the sort of material and things like that. And, and just how many of your comments out there are, are literally eaten. I'll see them. And they won't show up. They won't show up anywhere. I can't go into my creator studio and retrieve them. Maybe they were held because of whatever. No, they're just eaten. They're down the memory hole. Um, after seeing that, I actually thought about doing an experimental video in which I would ask everyone to, to leave a, just a comment, a quick, a quick comment, a word, anything, so I could start getting a good idea on is this um, because of what YouTube's doing, are they fooling with metrics? Are I, Now, I know subscribers that say they do get notifications of new videos. I know subscribers that say they don't. Um, I have old friends who are also creators on here who are, our comments ha have not gone through. Um, this is just par for the course. Now, I was able to upload finally my uh, The Obrey Hours Episode 9 onto BitChute after about 30-something tries. It finally uploaded. So, you know, things aren't good here. Things aren't good there. I personally am not all that in love with Odyssey or World Truth videos. Just their platforms are not... I mean, they're, they're pretty lame. I, honestly. And I, I can't believe that... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Paul English from um, Eurofolk Radio actually said that the Kaufman who owns Odyssey and Library has a uh, friendly name, but he's one of ours. Have you, have you looked at that guy? Anyways, but you know, uh, the folks over at Eurofolk Radio, um, a number of them oftentimes vouch for the, the most shady characters, and you have to wonder about that. <sighs> Anyways, all right, so let's, uh, let's go on. So we're right in Luke 4. Now, in Luke 4, you know, I don't nitpick it much, but there is something that has to be pointed out because it's going to be made manifest in spades as we move forward, and it's chronology. Now, at first, some people might not think that chronology is that big a deal. Um, I do. Uh, as somebody who has studied history for a long time, who has, I've liked history since I was in high school, 
And the history they taught us in high school was crap. And I still liked history. Um, chronology is really important. Let's just, here, let's take, for example, you know, Anatoly Fomenko, he came up with that system that would look at uh, chronologies about certain events, maybe written by different uh, writers, and he would use certain mathematical principles. It was it was almost like a a waveform principle concerning characters, events, and things like that, and how likely they were to be concurrent, you know, to match up and to be trustworthy. Now, I don't know that I entirely agree with applying specifically and only mathematical principles. Although I don't see it as a problem with using it as, let's say, one of, uh, we have a set of criteria, and that's one of the things that we're going to apply it. I don't have a problem with that because you can show patternistically this doesn't match. You know, if, if, if his mathematical applications manifested themselves in, in a sort of uneven sine wave, uh, S-I-N-E sine wave, and uh, the peaks and troughs were just way off, then that would be one thing that we could look at and say, yeah, um, I, I can certainly see how that's a problem. So if we did that with chronology, and we did that with the chronology of Luke and other Gospels, specifically Matthew, it wouldn't even be a sine wave anymore. It would look like a loop-de-loop because the chronologies in Luke are so radically different than the chronology in Matthew. Now that's a real problem, guys. Um, if we were looking at multiple historians, and, and we've seen this in our own time, okay? Let's go back to the world in the 1930s and 40s. And, uh, and let's consider how many different stories have been told about those events? And we, we dig through it all and, and we start finding authors that are emerging as being most truthful, most dependable. And we start seeing these other authors that are, are not looking too dependable. And one of the reasons is, is because they're not representing chronology correctly. And we want to make a case to somebody how that's all establishment junk. One of the things anybody would use, they would point right out, they would say, these guys don't even get their chronology right. They're saying that, that, um, that this event, this very important event, happened before this other one. When the, the other writers, who are more trustworthy, say that this other event actually occurred first. You know that if you were making a case for or against the historicity or, or accuracy of, of any given author, you would include whether or not they got their chronology of events correct. Now, whether you want to side with Luke or you want to side with Matthew, that's kind of besides the point. For now it is. The point is, the chronology of Luke and the chronology of Matthew are not remotely close. And we'll see that as we go. Now, in Luke 4, it's not as apparent as it's going to be. There is one thing, it's just a little thing. I'm not going to nitpick this, but it's, it's a little thing. Now, in Luke 4.18, when, uh, when the author, who will assume is Luke, for the sake of this, is quoting uh, a prophecy, uh, a verse, actually, that uh, you show Jesus is reading, he, um, he quotes it from Isaiah 61.1. Now, for the most part, it is true to form. However, there is one thing to me, and we could argue that this is a manuscript thing, and that's fine. But I do just want to point this one thing out. There is a little bit of a difference, and to me it just, it feels, it doesn't feel great, okay? And I just want to point that out real quick. 
what I want to point out is right at the end of this verse. And again, it might seem kind of benign, but when we look at the entire picture, when we've gone through, you know, most of everything that we're, we're seeing problematic here, uh, hopefully that will be remembered. Because I, I think that some of these are pretty subtle, but, you know, the thing with subtleties is if there's enough of them, they just kind of stack up and stack up. So most of the verse is pretty much right on with how we're getting it translated. And of course, this is all coming from the King James translation. If you look at the underlying Obri, or Hebrew, um, in Isaiah, you'll see that the, the variation that's represented in Isaiah, it's, it's relatively true to form, really. The key words. So, the quote is, um, so they said that uh, Jesus, I guess for the sake of this, Jesus, he goes into a synagogue. First off, that's wrong. It, he would have gone to a, a quell or a ma'od or something like that. The synagogue's a, uh, an entirely foreign term. Um, and no, I don't believe that any Judahite or Israelite was spending their time in a place called a synagogue. Jews of today may have adopted this, this synagogue thing, and that's possibly why synagogue was inserted into these texts, the same as the word Jew instead of Judahite. But, so here we go. It said he's, he um, was asked to read, and he reads this quote, which we can find in Isaiah 61.1. The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, there is a significant enough difference to, to read this real quick. Now, up to a point, he had it right. Um, and we get halfway into the verse here in Isaiah 61.1. He has sent me to, the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, very close, to proclaim liberty to the captives not the bruised, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, or actually uh, the them that are are grade, so it would be the prison to bound. Those who are bound, it would be a, um, an, an attributive uh, descriptive word, bound, not bruised. So the last two uh, phrases in Isaiah are alluding to those who are captive and those who are bound. And there were many, many Israelites who were captive and who were bound. They were captive and bound because of their own lawlessness. That's quite true. But just note the emphasis placed on it in Luke as opposed to Isaiah. Now, we could say that that's just translator choice and all of that, but but when we check the Greek, it they say the root is this word thrauo. It only appears here, and they're saying it's bruised. I don't know. Could go either way. Thrauo almost sounds like thrall to me, which means enslaved. So then I guess you'd have to wonder if it were, which it's hard to say at this point in time whether it is or not why the translators would have chosen to put it that way. So anyways, um, I certainly wouldn't trust the team of translators who did the King James Version. But not to spend too much time in that, I want to go over a few verses that he's, according to Luke, supposed to have said right after he read that passage from Isaiah. It starts in Luke, we'll say Luke, 424. And it, it reads, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, meaning Elijah or Aliyah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias, Elijah, sent, save unto Sarepta, or um, Zerpat, uh, it would be Tsarpat in uh, Obri, Tsarpat, 
a city of Tzidun, unto a woman that was a widow. Uh, the that and was is added, unto a widow woman. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisius, or Elisho, Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the <laughs> Syrian, uh, Naaman the Arame, actually. And then it goes on to say, And they in all of the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up to thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of a hill whereon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Now, first off, that passage is not to be found anywhere else. Okay, Luke is the only person who claims uh, that you show Jesus said that. What I find interesting about this passage, though, a couple of things. This is going to, this passage actually lends itself to a sort of a case that Luke, in his account, is going to be building, or an image that Luke, in his account, is going to be putting together that's quite at odds with what Matthew uh, represents Jesus' mind and his thoughts and his attitudes are. They are in stark contrast, we'll see throughout Luke, to the, the attitude or the facts as according to Matthew are. And this is, this is one of them. This is the first part that we're going to see. Now, this whole thing about, okay, so there was a drought, we can actually go back to 1 Kings. It's in 1 Kings chapter 17 that uh, Elijah, Aliyah, Elijah had prayed and Yahweh had brought a drought. And for some time, Elijah had stayed near a brook. And because the famine had continued on quite a long time, this, this brook dried. And then starting in 1 Kings 17, 8, he said, And the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Tsarpat, or uh, Zarephath is the transliteration, which belongeth, belongeth as in gray, to Tzidon. So it's just saying, uh, which to Tzidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As Yahweh thy Aliyim lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hadst said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Okay, so this story continues to the end of the chapter, and her, her son actually falls ill, and uh, it looks like he's, he's dead, and, and Elijah actually revives him. In the course of that, the widow is lamenting the condition of her son, and at one point she says, uh, How art thou come uh, unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Now, the wording of that in, in Obri I find a little bit dubious. But she's saying something similar. Similar. So there's a couple of things. First off, in 1 Kings 17, it does not say that this woman is not an Israelite. I want to make that clear. It does not say that. And even though 
Yahweh has been known to send his prophets from time to time, literally, physically, geography, to another land and to another people. He does do that. He sent Jonah to Nineveh. Um, certain prophets wrote books to other people, other nations, and other lands. And a number of the major prophets actually have portions of their works in which they are prophesying to other people. That's true. However, if we go back to, um, we can go back to Joshua, and I'm going to do this, I'm actually going to do this uh, somewhat quickly through a quick cross-reference. So what we'll see when we get back to Joshua are references to Tzidon or Sidon, uh, as well as actually references to Tzur or Tyr. Um, Tyr is less obvious because they hide it more. But what we see is in Joshua, um, it's chapter 19, when they are describing um, the, I'm sorry, the, the inheritance that each tribe is given. In Joshua 19.28, so they're going over Asher. And these are the territories that Asher took. It, it's naming um, along the border Hebron, Rehob, and we know that from a number of other passages, this place called Rehob was at one of the extremities of what was considered the land of Canaan, which is what they took, okay? And Hammon and Keneh, even unto its, uh, it says, Tzidon Rabbe. Um, Rabbe is typically translated as the broadness. Some translations will say greater Tzidon. Their, their border went to Tzidon. They had cities near Tzidon. Uh, when part of the tribe of Dan travels to, to acquire more land, they, they come across a place and take a place that is also near Tzidon. And based on the stories that we have from, for instance, 1 Kings, it's probably mirrored in 1 Chronicles, we know that Tzidon was a probably a very heavily wooded area um, that the, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the Leb it was called El Lebanon, probably extended a great deal into Tzidon. It wouldn't have been remotely odd for Tzerpat to actually be belonging to Israel and full of Israelites but yet be considered as this area of Tzidon. For one thing, another thing is, during the time of David and Solomon, the kingdom was expanded outward. And in fact, Yahweh says to Israel when he's articulating the law back in the time of Moses, that once Israel took the land of Canaan, that they would expand. They would expand outward. One of the borders that David actually had secured and helped to expand was that of the north. Um, Solomon even more so. So it's real tricky here to, to just consider that, well, he must have been talking about a foreign woman. Well, if so, I'm just going to say that it is interesting that she recognizes him as a man of Yahweh, for one thing, and recognizes her own iniquity, which it's hard to know what your own iniquity is if you're not familiar with the law, which tells you what your own iniquity in fact is. So that's another thing. So did he say that is kind of the point because we don't have another gospel we don't have any other reference that says that he said that to the judahites or the israelites that were in this place that they're calling a synagogue at this particular time the second thing is uh naaman 
know, and says that there were a lot of lepers in the land, uh, but none of them were healed except for, for Naaman. The Arami, okay, Syria is another one of those things that was forcefully inserted into the text because of that land area over there in the Middle East being considered called Syria for a very, very, very long time. There's a story to that too, by the way. And the other thing is, this idea of leprosy, that's another term that was inserted into the text, and I don't think there's really enough description. When you look at like Le Leviticus 13, I believe it is, when it's talking about when the priest would determine if somebody had something that was, say, contagious, where they had to be shut up or not, the terminology is really rough going there for you to actually prove that leprosy is what's being talked about. Now, I know in Greek, the word there is lepros, but um, there's a lot about Greek that I wouldn't trust. I certainly wouldn't trust that that was the original language that these letters, the ones that were authentic, were written in, and maybe even ones that were untrustworthy were first written in Obri and then Greek. I can't say right now. But in the story of um, Naaman, the Aramee, so he's um, he's like the he's the top guy in Aram uh, next to the king. And Aram was a very powerful kingdom who had been battling with the northern kingdom of Israel or the house of Israel for a very long time. They were a very formidable foe even given the size and the strength of the kingdom of Israel as opposed to the kingdom of Judah, um, they were a serious adversary. And because Yahweh was judging uh, the house of Israel, he brought a ram uh, against Israel quite a lot. Quite a lot. And eventually, they sort of made up towards uh, the end of the house of Israel's time before Yahweh had them carried away captive by Asher, Assyria. Um, so what happened was Naaman has this, uh, this handmaid, um, basically a slave that he acquired from Israel. So we're looking at white people who enslaved and had as servants other white people. Um, that was not against the law. It was against the law to summarily enslave your own people, Israel. Okay? Um, there were just certain things you could not do to your own nation and kinsmen. So anyways, in this account, his, uh, his servant girl, this Israelite, told him there was this great prophet. And she's talking about Elisha. And so what the king does is he sends a letter to the king of Israel inquiring um, because his top guy has got some sort of affliction that they're calling leprosy. So in 2 Kings 5-7, <clears throat> when the king of Israel gets this letter, uh, the letter basically says um, he wants to send Naaman to him and he wants a prophet to recover him of this condition he has. So the, the king of Israel gets this letter. He, it says he rents his clothes and he says, Am I God to kill and to make alive uh, that this math, man does send me to recover a man of his medical condition? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. He thinks he's, he's going to use this as a means to start another war, another battle, and they've, Aram and Israel have been going around and round for a very long time by now. Um, in fact, if we were looking at it, it was really bad, the fighting, when Ahab was the king, and I haven't referenced this to see if Ahab or his son is still sitting on the throne. In fact, there was a man who was not related to Ahab, uh, Yehu, that, that actually took the throne after um, so anyways, it's probably Ahab, and he said, uh, Elisha, the man of God, has heard that the king of Israel has rent his clothes, and he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet 
in Israel. So this was very political, the reason that Elisha even did this had much to do with delivering Israel. And, of course, there could have been more to it than that. Um, but simply the idea that there were all these lepers in the land, if it was indeed leprosy, and I'm not sure of that whatsoever, and that Elisha would not heal any of them, but he healed someone who was not an Israelite. This is the theme. And we're going to see this theme in stark contradistinction to Matthew as we continue ahead in Luke. Nowhere else cited this account and the specifics that is said that Jesus said concerning what he was supposed to be talking about are questionable. So, all right, moving forward. And real quick, I'm sorry, before I get to that last thing in Luke chapter 4 that I have to touch on, this should actually, just the fact that he, in, as according to Luke, is in an assembly of Israelites, and according to Luke, he's pointing out this idea that though there were many hungry in the land of Israel during the drought in Elijah's day, he goes to a Sidonian. And though there were many afflicted with maybe leprosy, in the days of Elisha, he only heals a non-Israelite, an Arame. Okay, that's the idea that we're getting from Luke, according to his account, when you show Jesus is first in this assembly after he comes out of the wilderness. Now, the interesting thing is you can contrast that to Matthew. In fact, in Matthew, when he comes from the wilderness, and it says in Matthew uh, 4.13, it says, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, now he's giving, he's going to, quote Isaiah here, but he's going to give a very different quote from Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. To them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in Matthew, he's prophesying specifically to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And there were still sparse Israelites and various Judahites dwelling in that land. And again, this is not the whole case. We're going to see the, the distinct case that Luke is building as we go. But I did want to point that out. Here's the next thing, and this is the last thing in Luke chapter 4, is the chronology issue. So this first really weird chronology issue starts in Luke 4.38. It says, after the, <laughs> the assembly, So he arose out of the assembly, and he entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, and then they said that they brought a lot of uh, they who were sick with diverse d diseases, and he laid hands on them and he healed them. Now, that we'll also see in Matthew 2, but we have to look at the oddity of Luke saying that after the assembly or the synagogue, um, that he went to Simon's house and he healed his mother. Now, the thing is, if we go to the chronology of Matthew, we see that after he had come to Capernaum, that he is walking by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw the, these two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, casting their net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets, and they followed him. And going on from thence, he saw 
uh, two others, James and John, and he called them. All right. Now, right after this is actually where Matthew's account and Luke's account sort of harmonize again. Because in Matthew it says, and he went all about uh, Galilee teaching in their uh, synagogues, assemblies, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and manners of disease among the people. Well, who would be amongst the assemblies of Judah? It would not be foreigners if you understand anything about what the assembly was, what the Kel was, what the Mo'od was. It was Israelites. Whether they be Judahites or Israelites from the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, that's who the assemblies are. They're Israelites. It says his fame went, and this is interesting, throughout all of, which would have had to have been a ram, but of course they say Syria in here. This is Matthew, again, 424. And they brought to him all the sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed, and, and they which were lunatic and palsy, and he healed them. Now again, this goes back to the idea of, if he's talking about somebody, uh, Elijah, who went to a woman, a widow woman, in Sidon, does that mean she had to be a Sidonim as far as her tribal affiliation? And the answer is no. The same thing with any of these people who were living around a ram that he brought to him that he was healing. They would have likely have been Israelites, and we'll see why echoed throughout Matthew. It would also be very strange if he was spending a lot of time healing non-Israelite people, especially when we consider the dialogue that goes on between him and the Canaanite woman in Matthew. But, back to this idea of Luke saying that after he was at the synagogue, that he healed Simon's mother. And he is talking about Peter when he says Simon. Luke is. Because here's the thing. When we go back to Luke, and we click on Luke, and we see our cross-reference, that same story is also accounted for in Matthew, but not in Matthew chapter 4, not in 5, nor 6 or 7. It is recounted in Matthew in chapter 8. All kinds of things have happened from the time he called uh, Peter and his brother, James and John, or Simon and his brother, James and John, until he heals his mother in Matthew chapter 8. So what Luke is telling us happened at this time is wildly out of chronology with Matthew. And he's talking about the exact same story. Now next, I am going to point out that in Luke chapter 5, starting in 5.1, this is Luke's account of when you show Jesus calls his first disciples. Now, in Luke's account, this is where you show tells Simon to launch out and let down his nets because he said he's been fishing, they had nothing. And he says, but fine, since you say so, I will. And he goes and he has so many fish that the net broke. Um, and, and this is where Peter, Simon Peter, he says, depart from me. This is where he says, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. It, well, the thing is, that account, that's not in Matthew. In Matthew, it simply says that he saw them and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Um, and, it, and, and then it says, and they straight away left their nets and followed him. Now, that, what Luke is saying, was significant enough in my eyes where I would think anyone would want to include that. I mean, he hadn't caught anything, and he commands him to go and let down his nets. He lets down his nets, and he's got so many fish that they broke the nets. 
I would find that significant. In fact, I included my reference to Mark. It's Mark 1, 16 through 20. I can check that real quick. Maybe it's actually in Mark that way. And, and so we can see that, well, at least it's in Mark. But look, I'm looking in Mark, in Mark 1, 16 through 20. It's essentially the same thing as Matthew. So this whole idea of from the first time he calls Peter, who he made essentially his chief apostle in Matthew, in Luke, we see him painted as a very brash guy who tells Jesus at first, you know, what are you talking about? We've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything, but uh, if you say so, and he goes and he finds it, oh, he, he did this great miracle. And, and so, you know, Peter has to tell him, get away from me because I'm a terrible, terrible, terrible person. This isn't reflected in Matthew or Mark. Just Luke. Now, one more significant thing about Luke 5. Starting in Luke 5.17 is an account of Jesus healing a paralytic. And I don't know that I necessarily have to go through the whole thing. However, the idea is that um, on a certain day... Now remember, let's think about chronology. In chronology, he was supposed to have come from the wilderness went to the synagogue. There was that whole scene with the synagogue where they were going to throw him off the cliff because he said that um, basically they were rejected and they were rejected back then for a Sidonian and a, an Arame. Uh, and this supposedly made them so mad they were going to throw him off a cliff. And he went, you know, from, from the midst of them. And then still according to Luke in 4, then he's supposed to have healed Simon's mother. Well, now, the, the weird thing is, it, it was even out of chronology with itself, because he doesn't call them in Luke until Luke 5. So, I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't know how he knew them, because in Luke 4, he's supposed to have healed Simon's mother. So he knew him well enough to be in his house, hanging out with him in his house, and healing his mother. And you would think if he healed his mother the way that he did in Luke chapter 4, he wouldn't have questioned him when he told him to put out his nets, right? But apparently in Luke 4, he knew him beforehand. But in Matthew, he didn't know him beforehand. In Mark, he didn't know him beforehand. I'm pretty sure in John, he didn't know him beforehand. And then we see it way out of whack because in Matthew, it's, it's in Matthew chapter 8 that he heals Simon Peter's mother. And remember, there was a whole heck of a lot that went on between Matthew 4 and Matthew 8. There's the whole Sermon on the Mount. A lot transpired for it to be that out of whack chronologically. Now, there's just a couple of interesting things about the account where um, Luke says that he healed the, the paralytic. Um, Matthew also recounts this. The particulars are a little bit different, but the spirit is essentially the same in the two stories. I will, however, point out a couple of things. First off, it is again far out of chronology with Matthew. In Matthew, this doesn't occur until Matthew 9. Now, they're both in chronological order as far as him healing um, Peter's mother first, and then the paralytic sort of, at least the one came before the other, but they are far out of whack as far as what they are saying that he did during the time of his ministry. From Luke 5, right after he calls his disciples, he's healing this paralytic, and in Matthew, he calls his disciples in 4, and many things transpire in Matthew. Look, let me just give you an illustration real quick so I can do this, all right? We'll, we'll just go by those headings that you get as you, you read through, okay? So in Matthew 4.18, we have the heading, Jesus calls his first disciples. Then Jesus ministers to great crowds. Then the Sermon on the Mount. So the Beatitudes, salt and light, Christ came to fulfill the law, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, 
love your enemies, giving to the needy, Lord's Prayer, fasting. So this could all be a long discourse, right? Judging others. And then the authority of Jesus. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, people were astonished. He taught them having authority as the scribes. Then Jesus cleanses maybe a leper, a man with a condition. All right. Then, and we're still in Matthew, because in Matthew, he's, he's come down from a mountain. He was on a mountain for the Sermon on the Mount. So there's that. He's come down from that. There's the faith of the centurion. So in Matthew, this is where uh, he entered into Capernaum. There came a centurion beseeching him, right? And then again, it goes on. Then he went into Peter's house in Matthew 8, 14. Okay. Um, and now after this, he saw great multitudes about him, following him, because this is in, in Matthew, it says that, um, that they had brought many more people who were sick and he had healed them. So this is happening over a course of time. Okay. And then still staying in Matthew, we're in 818, the cost of following him, uh, more things are being done. Then more time is passing because in Matthew 8, 23, it says, Then he entered the ship, and his disciples followed him. And a great storm arose, and he calmed the sea. This is happening overnight. And then, in Matthew 8, 28, Jesus heals two men with demons. This is happening when he came to the other side, to this country that they call in the New Testament, the Gergesenes, which we can actually match that up with a certain people in a certain geography, which we won't get into. Okay, that's happening too. And then we see the account of the paralytic. And in Matthew, it says he entered into a ship, passed over, and came into his own city. Now that's kind of interesting right there because he's supposed to be from Nazareth, right? If you look on a map where they say Nazareth is supposed to be, it's probably about 20 miles, and that's as the crow flies. That's not counting the very rough and uneven, pain-in-the-neck geography of Palestine getting there. Besides the fact that the, the Gergeshi weren't very likely, based on everything we learn about them in the Old Testament, to me, living on the east side of the lake of... The, Tiberius, if they were indeed in Palestine. But I won't get too caught up in that. I'm just showing you how many things have actually chronologically transpired from the time when Matthew says he called his disciples until that time of healing the paralytic. And then in Luke, he supposedly calls the disciples, then he's cleansing a leper, and then he's healing a paralytic. And it's just boom, boom, boom. Completely different, unreconcilable chronology. So most of the rest of Luke 5 is chronologically staying in order with Matthew 9, which of course is already way out of chronological order as far as leaving things out, saying certain things happened, before they were supposed to have happened in Matthew by a lot. But I'll only point out one small little thing. When in Luke 5, when he's said to have called Levi or Matthew, there's a quote when it says the Pharisees murmured against him because he was eating with, you know, in their uh, estimation, publicans and, and whatnot and sinners. They just, it, Luke leaves out a little thing here. Um, in Luke, it says that he said, They who are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. However, in Matthew, it says that he said, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And that's important because he is referring to a point in the law, something that Yahweh said through the law and the prophets that he would rather have not particularly mercy, 
No, when we, we reference that, and this is very important, obedience. Obedience. He would rather have obedience and an obedient heart than to have sacrifices, offerings, and gifts, which really, it, it, to many who had plenty, it really didn't mean much to them. And from everything we see concerning the Pharisees, the scribes, and the other religious government leaders um, in the land at the time, they all seemed to be very well-to-do. And I doubt it meant too much to them to give for their lack of obedience. And he's drawing a contrast that Matthew records that Luke doesn't. A very important contrast. I would add. Now we'll go on to 6. Now Luke 6, 1 through 5 starts out with the account of uh, you showed Jesus and his disciples walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath and, the, and they were plucking and eating. And, and everybody knows that Palestine is a very uh, hot spot for growing corn, right? So anyways, Luke's account actually leaves out a great deal that Matthew's account includes, and that the text that Matthew's account includes is very important for one thing. Luke's is, it's far shorter. And, and to tell you the truth, with as truncated as it is, it really doesn't make a lot of sense like Matthew's account makes. The other thing is, now this being in Luke 6, we, we left off where they were kind of chronologically matching up through Matthew 8 and 9, was kind of chronologically ma matching up with Luke 5 and 6. However, if we want to find this same account in Matthew, we have to jump three full chapters forward. So when we left off, we were in Matthew chapter 9. And we saw that, of course, there was a certain amount of, of chronological harmony between the two, uh, at least for a certain portion. But now, where Luke jumps straight into this, uh, the going through the cornfields, from where we were at with him calling Matthew, we have a number of other things transpiring in Matthew that we're not seeing in Luke. All we have in Luke is it, it stays true to form with Matthew in Luke 5 when they move to the question of fasting and then we go right through them going through the cornfields and them being confused. However, in Matthew, right after the account with him being at Levi or Matthew's house, then we go into the question about fasting. Then the girl restored to life and a woman healed. Then Jesus heals two blind men. And then, and remember, things are happening in between. If he's going to certain other places, there's time transpiring. This is not a little thing. This is, this is time. Okay, this is a significant amount of time. Then Jesus heals a man unable to speak. Then there's the harvest is plenty, the laborers few. Uh, then the twelve apostles. In Matthew, he's sending out the twelve apostles. All right? And he's giving them their, their charge. And we're going to get back to this and talk about what he charges them and its contrast to Luke. Um, persecution, have no fear, uh, rewards. It's, it's a lengthy passage. Um, then Matthew 11, the messengers from John the Baptist. That whole thing. Uh, Woe unto the repentant cities. Come to me, I will give you rest. And then... At that time, they're walking through the cornfield. A whole lot of time has passed in Matthew chronologically, where in Luke we go right from the, um, the question of um, fasting, which was likely answered when he was eating at Matthew's house, right to Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. So he's walking through the cornfield. Nothing about him sending out his disciples and giving them the charge and all of that other stuff that we saw. And in fact, we're going to see a real serious chronological issue with Luke's account of that.
Now in Luke, when the, the Pharisees, uh, when they see them going through and, and just plucking corn and eating it with their hands, and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing unlawful about them doing that on the Sabbath, walking through and doing that. Now, when they accuse him in Luke, according to Luke, he answers them, Have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which was not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them, That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Um, okay. Well, that was brief. I mean... <sighs> That answer was actually so short, it almost seems like because I said so. However, if we go to Matthew 12, we see it's starting out very, very similar, almost exactly the same. However, when he answers them, starting in Matthew 12, 3, But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him? how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. So far we're right on the money. However, he continues, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meant, and this is really important, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Didn't he just say that to them when he was with Levi, Matthew, and in their eyes, the sinners and the publican and all that? Didn't he just say that to them? And if we refer to the law, we can see that that means it's obedience, not mercy. Obedience. He's saying this to them again. He's reminding them again. Like, didn't you think about that? I had told you about that, right? He had referenced this point to them earlier. Like, days ago, at least. He says he's reminding them. He's bringing this up. So this is probably the same people. If you knew what it meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Very different. Matthew includes some lines that, in my opinion, are absolutely vital for us to understand the exchange or ongoing exchange that is happening between him and the religious governmental leaders of his day. All right, with that, um, I don't think I'm going to beat a dead horse by pointing out a couple of just little things that are out with Matthew and with Mark, uh, because they're supposed to be synoptic gospels, you know, so that's another reason why I might be referring to Matthew and Mark more than I'm referring to John. If If we get into John territory, this will explode into just a huge, huge series. Um, so I'm going to pick it up on the next one, starting with the Sermon on the Mount, which, of course, as we can see, if it's happening at this point, starting in Luke 6.20, it is ridiculously out of chronological sync with Matthew. And as a matter of fact, it is so weird that we would have to think that because what we have here is in Luke, it says in Luke, um, starting, I guess, in Luke 13, that he called his disciples and he chose 12 of whom he named apostles. And then right after this, we, we have the Sermon on the Mount. Strangely enough, in Matthew, starting in Matthew chapter 4, we see him calling the disciples and then going right into the Sermon on the Mount as per Matthew chapter 5. And in Luke, 
we have it starting in Luke 6, 20, or, well, starting in Luke 6, uh, 13, that it says he actually named a certain amount of his disciples, apostles, names some of them, and then we have a, a short little clip here where it says uh, he came down to them, stood in the plain, and the company of disciples and a great multitude of people went about Judea and Jerusalem from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear them. Again, we're not told these are Israelites or Judahites. Again, Luke is, in, is constantly bringing into this people from certain areas who could or could not be uh, racial, let's say, ethnic Israelites. And that's going to become a very strong theme as we go forward. Um, whereas in Matthew, let's see. It said, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. This is Matthew 5, 1, um, right before he starts the Sermon on the Mount. And in Luke six seventeen, And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples, and a great multitude came from them. He vexed them. Uh, those were vexed. He healed them, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for they were virtue of him, and he healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Now, in Luke 6.17, it says, He came down to him because before that he was up in a mountain. And then it said that, and then after that, he uh, he came to his disciples. He chose the twelve. And it says, and he came down to them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples. But again, we're talking about just topologically, it's far different. Because in Matthew 5, 1, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And I would say that matters. Did he go up into a mountain, or did he come down and sit in the plain and give his Sermon on the Mount? Because the Sermon on the Mount is where we're going to pick it up next time. See you then.